Hello, my name is Darlene Sherrill, and I've been involved with reading, writing, and talking about fluoride for more than 30 years. This is a message about new sources of fluoride in both foods and beverages. It's about what fluoride can do to ruin a young child's permanent teeth before you even see them, and what it can do to cripple both children and adults with a condition usually misdiagnosed as arthritis. In the summer of 1976, I thought fluoride was good for dental health and absolutely safe. Then I met a woman who said it was poison. I knew she had to be wrong. I had given my older daughter fluoride supplements years earlier, before it was added to our tap water. Why would they put poison in vitamins for toddlers? But a few weeks later, when I finally took the time to check, it was like being transported to Wonderland with Alice and the White Rabbit. The history of man's use of fluoride for dental health is so bizarre, so complicated, so far-reaching, and so important it has kept my attention to this day because the story isn't over. In fact, it changed my life because I learned that by avoiding fluoride as much as possible, my allergies, asthma, arthritis, and gastrointestinal problems would go away and stay away as long as I was very careful with my diet and used nothing but distilled water for drinking and cooking. From childhood, I'd had frequent and long-lasting aching bones and severe muscle cramps in my legs and stiff and swollen joints in my hands. At first, doctors said it was rheumatism, but later they called it rheumatoid arthritis. However, within a year of changing my diet, 10 years before even considering fluoride, all of that was gone. I have been pain-free since 1967, except for those rare occasions when I've been careless and eaten too much of something I wasn't sure about. Within hours, I get the message and stop eating whatever it was. Most of the time, everything is back to normal within a day or two, but it can also take months. It happened to me in 1995 from air pollution in Trinidad. Anyway, the stuff is definitely poison. Apparently, I'm one of a small percentage of people who are unusually sensitive to fluoride. I know several people who have been diagnosed with systemic fluoride poisoning, and they share many of my symptoms. Most of us have gone through a double-blind test with fluoridated and non-fluoridated water to rule out other causes. No one really knows how many people have been poisoned because there haven't been any studies capable of detecting them until the advanced stage of crippling skeletal fluorosis. Arthritis and other health problems caused by fluoride don't count when it comes to water and pesticide regulations. Only the final stage, described as crippling deformities of the spine and major joints with neurological deficits due to compression of the spinal cord. It's a lot like saying cancer is okay, as long as you're not dead. In 1977, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, NASNRC, published a book called Drinking Water and Health. In it, they expressed concern that the then current daily intake estimates were as high as 4 to 5 milligrams. And if these estimates are accurate, people might be retaining as much as 2 milligrams of fluoride daily, which for the typical individual is enough to cause phase 3 crippling skeletal fluorosis after 40 years. Before that time, everyone thought people were still getting the same dosage they got during the 1940s, one and a half milligrams per day in areas where there was one milligram of fluoride in each liter of water. At that time, they didn't have fluoride toothpaste or other dental products, and sources of fluoride other than drinking water provided only about one quarter milligram per day. For that reason, doctors, dentists, and research scientists made assumptions based on the concentration of fluoride in a water supply, not the actual quantity of fluoride ingested by the people. Then, in 1997, the Institute of Medicine, IOM, which is also part of NASNRC, told us we've always been getting 4 milligrams per day in areas with one part per million fluoride in the water supply even though they cited the same reference that reported it as 1.5 milligrams per day in 1943. It's the only reference they cite that was published prior to 1979, yet the numbers are completely different. What's strange is that in 1989, IOM's recommended dietary allowances said 1.5 milligrams per day was optimum, 
but warned against exceeding 4 mg per day in order to avoid the development of crippling skeletal fluorosis. Then, just a few years later, they raised the recommended intake from 1.5 to 4 mg and raised the tolerable intake from 4 to 10 mg, with no new research other than one man who mentioned another man who had used some high fluoride water from age 22 to age 30 without developing crippling skeletal fluorosis. The water was high in magnesium and sulfate, so it wasn't used much for drinking and cooking. Believe it or not, that's the proof that water fluoridation, as well as current pesticide residue tolerances, are safe. That's modern science for you. The same dose is crippling one day and safe the next, depending on the economic and political climate surrounding the poison itself. However, what you need to know is that EPA, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, recently approved a new pesticide with tolerances for fluoride residues on some basic items higher than 100 milligrams per kilo. Sulfurofluoride is a fumigant used to kill insects in food warehouses and processing plants. Tolerances for pesticide residues have been approved by EPA and they apply to virtually all agricultural products. That means that if you purchase foods or beverages made with ingredients that were fumigated with sulfurofluoride, and that includes just about every item you can name, what was once relatively safe to eat is now highly questionable. Here's what happened. They were phasing out the use of methyl bromide because of concerns about the ozone layer. And one of the agribusiness giants asked for and received permission to use their product on virtually everything. EPA's pesticide division set residue tolerances for various foods and food groups, which they consider safe, as long as the end result, the total daily intake of fluoride for humans, doesn't exceed a maximum of 8 milligrams. What matters is that thanks to EPA, people who were once exposed to a maximum of about 2 milligrams of fluoride daily can now look forward to ingesting as much as 8 milligrams someday. It could be worse. About 10 years ago, the Manchester Guardian ran a story with photos of two children who were badly crippled because they drank water from a relatively new borehole dug too deep in an area of India known for rich mineral deposits. The water had only 11 parts per million of fluoride, but almost all the children are knock-kneed and have the brown stained teeth characteristic of the first stages of fluoride poisoning. In China, the problem comes from air pollution because of rapid industrial development, and that translates to polluted water and food as well, even without considering artificial fertilizers and pesticides. Millions of children have already been badly crippled because of fluoride. Tea has always been a significant source of fluoride because of the nature of the plant itself. But recent analysis of green and black tea from China and India revealed it can now deliver six or more milligrams per cup. Meats and fish don't contain much fluoride, but their bones do. And if cooked in a liquid, the fluoride stored in those bones will contaminate the broth. If you use corned beef from a can, hot dogs, salami, processed luncheon meats, hamburger, sausage, or any ground meats that were separated from the bone by machine rather than by hand, there will be tiny little chips of bone, too small to see, and because of that, the concentration of fluoride in these processed meats can be as high as 35 milligrams per kilo. If you use a fluoride toothpaste, you will probably absorb about one-third of a milligram per use providing you rinse well and spit it all out after brushing. When infants and young children get too much fluoride, any more than about one half to one milligram per day, their permanent teeth can be so badly disfigured and damaged they'll need a lifetime of expensive cosmetic dentistry. With just a little too much, instead of translucent pearly white enamel on their two front teeth, they have extra white lines along the biting edge flex or an overall unnaturally porous white enamel that picks up stains easily. Fluoride is one of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. So any time we have to take something out of the ground to manufacture something else, there will be fluoride involved in one way or the other. And that's the root of the problem. After all, what doesn't come out of the ground? 
It's where we get the materials for everything we use on a daily basis, and massive amounts of fluoride wastes liberated during the manufacturing process must be disposed of somehow. This isn't about science. It's about politics and national security issues. Fluoride is known as the protected pollutant. Its reputation as a safe cavity fighter was created out of thin air by the U.S. government during a time when scientists were working furiously to make the first atomic bomb. We were at war. U.S. policymakers had good reason to deny the adverse effects of fluorine air pollution at the time. It was a matter of life and death. But that's not true today. Today, it's just a matter of profit and loss. Recently declassified documents from the Manhattan Project speak for themselves. This isn't a conspiracy theory. It's part of recorded history. Cereals, fruit juice, and cosmetic effects. Wherever you live, chances are that most of the fluoride in your diet comes from pesticides, fertilizers, air pollution, and prescription drugs. Young children who use toothpaste without supervision or consume ready-to-eat breakfast cereals and fruit juices are especially at risk. Sixty years ago, only about 10% of children who used one part per million fluoridated water developed the very mildest forms of dental fluorosis, not visible except to the trained eye of a dentist. Today, mild dental fluorosis is considered the norm in the United States, and for many years, dentists have been making more money fixing the damage caused by too much fluoride than by fixing the damage caused by tooth decay. At the same time, the U.S. government has decreed that no matter how badly stained and pitted your child's teeth are, it's not really an adverse health effect. It's only a cosmetic effect that occurs when infants and young children ingest more than one milligram of fluoride daily. The problem is, until the permanent teeth begin to come in, there's no way to know what's going on with the developing dental enamel, and no practical way to know how much fluoride a child is getting each day from the things they eat and drink. The 1991 results of the United Kingdom Total Diet Study showed that tea was the major source of dietary fluoride for adults in that country. 1.3 milligrams of the total daily intake of 1.8 milligrams. More recently, analysis of ordinary black or green tea shows you can now get 6 milligrams per cup. Welcome to Wonderland. I'd like you to meet Alice and the Rabbit. Once upon a time, the safety of water fluoridation was based on the assumption that people would get about 1 to 1.5 one milligrams of fluoride daily from all sources combined. They told us not to exceed 4 milligrams per day, or we might eventually reach the crippling stage of skeletal fluorosis. But now that we can get 6 milligrams of fluoride per cup of tea and almost 8 milligrams from pesticide residues, safety is still guaranteed. Not based on any new or even old safety studies, but simply because Uncle Sam said so. Unlike most chemical compounds that pollute our food and water supply, fluoride is ubiquitous. Its increasing presence in virtually everything we eat and drink is protected by an outdated policy born over 60 years ago in order to minimize environmental and health concerns perceived by Uncle Sam to be petty, costly, and potentially crippling to the nation itself. Fluoride-rich phosphate rock is used to some extent in the production of phosphates used in the manufacture of baking powders and is also the source of calcium or phosphorus used in many drugs and mineral supplements. Unfortunately, you won't see the word fluoride on the label. By law, they cannot add fluoride, but if it's already hidden in other ingredients, no one has to tell. No one is required to tell you how many times the corn, rice, oats, or wheat in your diet was fumigated with sulfuryl fluoride before leaving the warehouse for packaging or processing. No one is required to tell you the hamburger, hot dogs, salami, corned beef, and other processed meats that you buy at the grocery are usually high in fluoride because the meat itself was separated from the bone by machine rather than by hand. No one is required to tell you not to give a young child Welch's grape juice, 
even though it usually contains a huge amount of fluoride, and could cause several adverse health effects, including disfiguring damage to developing dental enamel. No doctor is going to warn you that your antibiotic or other prescription drug has enough fluoride in it to cause fibromyalgia. Most healthcare professionals didn't hear about it in school, so they never give it a thought. Why didn't they hear about it in school? Well, as usual, it's the money, honey. Industry and the air we breathe. Fluoride and our perception of its safety and effectiveness in preventing tooth decay is tied up with political, economic, and national security issues. Corporations cannot afford to protect workers exposed to fluoride on a daily basis. Governments cannot afford to admit knowing what they knew from the start. It's all very complicated, but nothing new. From this point forward, most of what you hear will have been quoted directly from books, articles, and reviews written by persons other than myself, including members of the National Academy of Sciences, the entity that interprets science for the U.S. government regulatory agencies, UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Emergency Fund, EPA insiders, and numerous other reliable sources. You may have heard of hydrogen fluoride, HF. It's a common, particularly dangerous, but relatively unknown air pollutant produced by the most powerful industries, including steel mills, iron foundries, copper, zinc and aluminum smelters, plastics manufacturers, fertilizer works, agrochemical factories, petrochemical refineries, brick works, glass factories, coal burning power stations, and nuclear processing plants. The use of unleaded gasoline puts more fluoride into the air. The late Dr. Jeffrey Smith said it well. If health authorities were to set air pollution standards for hydrogen fluoride, which were harmless, then certain key industries in our technologically oriented society would almost grind to a halt. This dilemma led to the most bizarre conspiracy of modern times, in which captains of industry and national security agencies combined to ruthlessly suppress evidence of the dangers of hydrogen fluoride air pollution, and cynically used a healing profession, dentistry, to promote an apparently beneficial image for fluoride. The result is that we live in an increasingly fluoridated world. The fluoride in water and toothpaste is potentially harmful. The hydrogen fluoride in contaminated air, far more so. Each year, tens of thousands of tons of hydrogen fluoride create an environmental hazard more threatening than global warming or depletion of the ozone layer, and hydrogen fluoride, which can be 1,000 times more harmful than sulfur dioxide, is often a key but rarely mentioned component of acid rain. Few people living in the developed countries of the world can escape exposure to HF. Workers in more than 60 occupations are now breathing HF contaminated air, and anyone living in the vicinity of the fluoride polluting industries is also at risk. In 1933, Dr. Lloyd de Eds, senior toxicologist with the Department of Agriculture and lecturer in pharmacology at Stanford, published a 60 page review on chronic fluorine poisoning. He wrote, only recently, that is within the last 10 years, has the serious nature of fluorine toxicity been realized, particularly with regard to chronic intoxication. It is from the viewpoint of chronic intoxication that fluorine is of importance to the public health. A review of the literature shows that the public health aspect of fluorine is manifested in industrial hygiene, in agriculture, and in foods. The latter aspect of the problem is particularly important because of the recommendation and increasing utilization of fluorine compounds in agriculture. While there is no real scientific evidence for beneficial effects of any kind, we do know that fluoride is more acutely toxic than lead and almost as bad as arsenic. The late Dr. Frederick B. Exner wrote, There has been fluorine poisoning as long as there have been plants, animals, and people unrecognized as such, of course, and mostly associated with volcanic phenomena or fluorine-bearing waters. Came the Industrial Revolution, and things were different. There came a wholesale pollution of air and countryside with fluorine fumes and fallout, and fluorine poisoning became an important industrial hazard. 
There were many sources, including glass, brick, enamel, and ceramic tile, but the worst offenders were the iron and copper smelters. The first recognized effects were on vegetation. To the majority of people bombarded with television commercials for fluoride dental products, fluoride means good dental health, and that's all. Very few people are aware of its use in pesticides, drugs, common cleaning agents, and other everyday household products. Even fewer realize that the deadly nerve gas sarin owes its toxicity to fluorine. More recently, Andreas Schuld, founder of Parents of Fluoride Poisoned Children, wrote, Dental fluorosis is the visible sign that thyroid function was disturbed in the child during the time of enamel formation. This enamel condition will lead to increased cavities later. As a result of research into molecular biology, the art of cloning, there are hundreds upon hundreds of studies available documenting the actions of fluorides on G proteins, the on and off switches involved in cellular signal transmission. During the 1980s and 1990s, fluorides became known as the universal G protein activator. Although there have been numerous studies before showing that fluorides act like TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, it can now be documented in deep detail, for it is known that G proteins in thyroid physiology are normally absolutely dependent on TSH and are inactive without it. TSH is the master, sometimes also referred to as the first violinist in the orchestra. The TSH receptor is the only receptor known able to activate all G protein families an activity directly imitated by fluoride. The Great Fluoride Scam In an article for Far Shore News titled The Great Fluoride Scam, James Donahue wrote, I was a child when fluoride, a byproduct from the manufacture of atomic bombs, was first introduced to the American people. Nobody told us where fluoride came from. All we knew is that it was a newly discovered chemical that would make our teeth extra hard and ward off cavities. When a free fluoride clinic was set up one summer in our school, all the kids in town lined up to have the bitter tasting stuff rubbed on their teeth. We were pretty gullible in those days. The period immediately following World War II was a time of scientific advancement. After the inventions of nylon, rayon, plastic, and other marvelous products that replaced fabrics, rubber, and steel during the war years, people were lulled into the belief that those balding men in white laboratory jackets could solve all of the problems of the world. The belief was so strong that we blindly accepted whatever a scientist told us. Nobody dreamed that we might be victims of fraud. But alas, after years of drinking, scrubbing, and consuming fluoride-laced products, we now learn that we've been scammed. This chemical is found to be totally ineffective in preventing tooth decay. Not only that, it seems to be directly linked to a variety of medical problems ranging from discolored teeth to bone disease and cancer. In short, fluoride is a poison. This is not news to the medical world. The Journal of the American Medical Association and the New England Journal of Medicine have both reported greater incidence of hip fractures in fluoridated areas. The National Institute of Environmental and Health Services has linked fluoridation with cancer. Yamianis writes that the acceleration of the aging process by fluoride occurs at the biochemical level by causing enzyme inhibition, collagen breakdown, genetic damage, and disruption of the immune system. Fluoride interacts with the bonds which maintain the normal shape of proteins, he continues. With distorted protein, the immune system attacks its own protein, the body's own tissue. The visual and physical effects from prolonged exposure to fluoride include nausea, bloody vomit, faintness, stomach cramps, tremors, constipation, aching bones, stiffness, skin rash, weight loss, and brown or black discoloration of the teeth. The horror in this story is that fluoride was known as a deadly poison from the start. But if this was true, why would the U.S. government promote the sale of it to its own people, and later people all over the world? There is compelling evidence that the program of water fluoridation began as a massive effort to cover up bad publicity from one of the most toxic materials to emerge from the government's secret nuclear weapons program. The idea was that if fluoride could be presented to the country as beneficial, then no one could sue the government for being harmed by it.
Now that the truth about fluoride is out, why haven't towns and toothpaste companies stopped dumping this terrible poison into our water and toothpaste supplies? Don't expect that to happen. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. Nobody shuts down a money machine like that without a fight. The latest word from the experts at NASNRC. In March of 2006, the National Academy of Sciences Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology released their 450-page review titled Fluoride in Drinking Water, a Scientific Review of EPA Standards. Here are a few examples of what they had to say. Grapes and grape products, teas and processed chicken can be high in fluoride apart from any contribution from preparation or processed water. There appears to be general acceptance in today's dental literature that enamel fluorosis is a toxic effect of fluoride intake that in its severest forms can produce adverse effects on dental health such as tooth function and caries experience. For example, the most severe forms of fluorosis manifest as heavily stained, pitted and friable enamel that can result in loss of dental function. In more severely fluorosed teeth, the enamel is pitted and discolored and is prone to fracture and wear. The degree of porosity, hypermineralization of such teeth results in a diminished physical strength of the enamel, and parts of the superficial enamel may break away. In the most severe forms of dental fluorosis, the extent and degree of porosity within the enamel are so severe that most of the outermost enamel will be chipped off immediately following eruption. With increasing severity, the subsurface enamel all along the tooth becomes increasingly porous. The more severe forms are subject to extensive mechanical breakdown of the surface. With more severe forms of fluorosis, caries risk increases because of pitting and loss of the outer enamel. Severe enamel fluorosis is treated to prevent further enamel loss and to address the cosmetic appearance of teeth. Treatments include bleaching, microabrasion, and the application of veneers or crowns. Bleaching and microabrasion are typically used with the mild to moderate forms of enamel fluorosis. Bleaching is the least invasive procedure, but does not eliminate the dark stains associated with severe enamel fluorosis. One of the functions of tooth enamel is to protect the dentin and ultimately the pulp from decay and infection. Severe enamel fluorosis compromises this health protective function by causing structural damage to the tooth. Fluorides also increase the production of free radicals in the brain through several biological pathways. These changes have a bearing on the possibility that fluorides act to increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Today, the disruption of aerobic metabolism in the brain, a reduction of effectiveness of acetylcholine as a transmitter, and an increase in free radicals are thought to be causative factors for this disease. More research is needed to clarify fluorides biochemical effect on the brain gastrointestinal system. The primary symptoms of GI injury are nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Such symptoms have been reported in case studies and in a clinical study involving double-blind tests on subjects drinking water artificially fluoridated at one milligram per liter. In the clinical study, subjects were selected whose GI symptoms appeared with the consumption of fluoridated water and disappeared when they switched to non-fluoridated water. A pharmacist prepared solutions of sodium fluoride and sodium silicofluoride so that the final fluoride ion concentrations were one milligram per liter. Eight bottles of water were prepared with either fluoridated water or distilled water. Patients were instructed to use one bottle at a time for two weeks. They were asked to record their symptoms throughout the study period. Neither patient nor physician administering the water knew which water samples were fluoridated until after the experiments were completed. From an immunologic standpoint, individuals who are immunocompromised, in other words, AIDS, transplant, and bone marrow replacement patients, could be at greater risk of the immunologic effects of fluoride. Overall, there was consensus among the committee that there is scientific evidence that under certain conditions, fluoride can weaken bone and increase the risk of fractures. Legal issues. Why haven't people been able to stop water fluoridation? The following is from a press release dated June 30, 1993. 
Despite serious questions on the wisdom of the city's course of action, Wisconsin Circuit Judge Peter Grimm today refused to order an end to the fluoridation of the local drinking water. In granting the city's motion for summary judgment in a suit filed last August by the Safe Water Association, Judge Grimm ruled that he did not have the power to enjoin fluoridation, despite the fact that the evidence proved that, one, significant scientific evidence links fluoride exposure to various adverse conditions in humans. The safety of fluoridation continues to be a matter of scientific debate and research in the areas of cancer, hip fractures, chromosomal abnormalities, and hypersensitivity. City exhibits show there are significant gaps in our knowledge of the effects of fluoride on the human body. 2. Fluoride causes dental fluorosis, which the city admits is an adverse health effect. A few percent of the general population, for the city many hundreds of children, will experience discoloring, pitting, and embrittling of their teeth due to fluoridation. 3. The city does not monitor its fluoridation program in any way to determine if it is effective. The city takes no steps to identify possible adverse effects or reactions by members of the community. The city does not know the maximum safe level of fluoride consumption or attempt to ascertain how many members of the community are exceeding that level. No physician monitors the health of citizens being medicated with hydrofluosilicic acid. How we stopped worrying and learned to love funky teeth. EPA insiders Drs. Robert J. Carton and J. William Hersey wrote, Sometime in the middle of April 1985, just one month before the proposed recommended maximum contaminant level was published in the Federal Register, private discussions with key personnel involved in the drafting of the new regulation began to surface some serious ethical problems. It started with a chance meeting between one of the authors, Carton, and a professional from the Office of Drinking Water in a hallway of the East Tower of Waterside Mall, EPA's headquarters. When we saw him in the hallway, he looked disgusted, so we asked him what was going on. He said he was writing the fluoride regulation and didn't believe a thing he was writing. He had to carry on, however, because it was his job. To put it another way, it was his duty to obey. There was also the unstated understanding, which all employees know, that if you buck the decision, you may end up with a poor performance appraisal, or worse. Years later, one professional, who blew the whistle on the downgrading of results in the animal cancer study of fluoride in drinking water, was fired, although later rehired after a protracted court battle. When the fluoride regulation was published, its author did protest with an unsigned, tongue-in-cheek press release that was circulated among the staff. Quote, the Office of Drinking Water, in conjunction with the Office of Management and Budget, proudly presents their new and improved fluoride regulation, or how we stopped worrying and learned to love funky teeth. Up to now, EPA, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, has regulated fluoride in order to prevent children from having teeth which look like they've been chewing brown shoe polish and rocks. The old standard, which was based upon the consumer's average shoe size and the phase of the moon, generally kept fluoride levels below 2.3 milligrams per liter. EPA, in response to new studies, which only confirmed the old studies, and some flat-out political pressure, has decided to raise the standard to 4 milligrams per liter. This increase will allow 40% of all children to have teeth gross enough to gag a maggot. EPA selected this level based on a cost-effectiveness study which showed that it is cheaper for people to keep their mouth shut than to remove the fluoride." Unquote. Thyroid Hormones As noted by Andreas Schuld, founder of Parents of Fluoride Poisoned Children, thyroid hormones are extremely important in the regulation of metabolic processes and brain development. Every cell in the body depends on thyroid hormones for regulation of their metabolism. Many of the symptoms documented in the vast literature on the subject of chronic or low-grade fluoride poisoning can be directly related to thyroid functions and disorders. One of the most prominent features of preskeletal fluorosis is the extraordinary general fatigue experienced by most sufferers. 
a marked weakness usually linked to low activity of the thyroid gland. It is only in the last two decades during which endocrinology has progressed so rapidly that now over 150 symptoms and associations can be identified in hypothyroidism. Almost all correlate with known symptoms of fluoride poisoning. Most of the double-blind test results, which led to the ban of fluoridation in Holland, are now recognized symptoms of hypothyroidism. In 1940, authors Robert H. Wilson and Floyd de Eds from the United States Department of Agriculture, discussing the role of fluorine in pesticide sprays, wrote, Should a spray residue tolerance limit for fluorine be set to protect the normal, the hyperthyroid, or the hypothyroid individual? Should the tolerance limit take into consideration that in certain areas the public is already exposed to a fluorine intake in the drinking water? Intelligence In September 2006, Chemical and Engineering News quoted NASNRC panel member Robert L. Isaacson, Emeritus Psychology Professor at the State University of New York, Binghamton. According to this article, Generally, fluoride impairs the brain's ability to perform signaling functions, with the consequence that messages that are passed along the many pathways are likely to be incomplete or wrong. One way fluoride interferes is by disrupting the creation and breakdown of neurofilaments in the axons of neurons. Fluoride also interferes with both primary and secondary signaling in the nervous system. Fluoride may also increase the number of plaques and tangles in the brains of adults, which could contribute to dementia. In several studies using rats, chronic exposure to sodium fluoride or aluminum fluoride in drinking water led to plaques and tangles in the rats' brains that are similar to the abnormalities found in Alzheimer's patients. Furthermore, it appears very likely that exposure to fluoride in the womb and throughout early life lowers intelligence. Epidemiological studies suggest that fluoridation of drinking water decreases the number of children at the very bright end of the IQ spectrum and increases the number in the low IQ region. UNICEF, the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund. Fluoride in water, an overview. In many countries, fluoride is purposely added to the water supply, toothpaste, and sometimes other products to promote dental health. It should be noted that fluoride is also found in some foodstuffs and in the air, mostly from production of phosphate fertilizers or the burning of fluoride-containing fuels, so that the amount of fluoride people actually ingest may be higher than assumed. It has long been known that excessive fluoride intake carries serious toxic effects, but scientists are now debating whether fluoride confers any benefit at all. Fluoride was first used to fight dental cavities in the 1940s. Its effectiveness defended on two grounds. One, fluoride inhibits enzymes that breed acid-producing oral bacteria, whose acid eats away tooth enamel. This observation is valid, but some scientists now believe that the harmful impact of fluoride on other useful enzymes far outweighs the beneficial effect on caries prevention. Two, fluoride ions bind with calcium ions, strengthening tooth enamel as it forms in children. Many researchers now consider this more of an assumption than fact because of conflicting evidence from studies in India and several other countries over the past 10 to 15 years. Nevertheless, agreement is universal that excessive fluoride intake leads to loss of calcium from the tooth matrix, aggravating cavity formation throughout life rather than remedying it, and so causing dental fluorosis. Severe, chronic, and cumulative overexposure can cause the incurable crippling of skeletal fluorosis. Dental fluorosis, which is characterized by discolored, blackened, mottled, or chalky white teeth, is a clear indication of overexposure to fluoride during childhood when the teeth were developing. These effects are not apparent if the teeth were already fully grown prior to the fluoride overexposure. Therefore, the fact that an adult may show no signs of dental fluorosis does not necessarily mean that his or her fluoride intake is within the safety limit. How Water Fluoridation Got Started According to Gary Null, 
Now, Dean remembered McKay and Black's claims that fluorosis victims' mottled, discolored teeth were especially resistant to decay. He came up with the notion that fluoride added to the water supply at the magic threshold dosage of one part per million would prevent tooth decay while avoiding damage to bones and teeth. He recommended further studies to determine whether his hypothesis was true. Back at the Mellon Institute, Alcoa's Pittsburgh Industrial Research Lab, this news was galvanic. There, biochemist Gerald J. Cox immediately fluoridated some lab rats in a study and concluded that fluoride reduced cavities and that the case should be regarded as proved. In a historic moment in 1939, the first public proposal that the U.S. should fluoridate its water supply was made not by a doctor or a dentist, but by Cox, an industry scientist working for a company threatened by fluoride damage claims and burdened by the odious expense of disposing of tons of toxic industrial waste. Cox began touring the country, stumping for fluoridation. Dean would go on to carve out a nice career for himself as the father of public water fluoridation. He became the first dental scientist at the National Institute of Health, advancing to director of the dental research section in 1945. After World War II, he directed epidemiological studies for the Army in Germany. When Congress established the National Institute of Dental Research, NIDR, in 1948, Dean was appointed its director, a position he held until retiring in 1953. In his post at the NIDR, he was to oversee the first clinical trial of fluoridation in an American city, Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is what Joel Griffiths and Chris Bryson had to say. Some 50 years after the United States began adding fluoride to public water supplies to reduce cavities in children's teeth, declassified government documents are shedding new light on the roots of that still controversial public health measure revealing a surprising connection between fluoride and the dawning of the nuclear age. Today, two-thirds of U.S. public drinking water is fluoridated. Many municipalities still resist the practice, disbelieving the government's assurances of safety. Since the days of World War II, when this nation prevailed by building the world's first atomic bomb, U.S. public health leaders have maintained that low doses of fluoride are safe for people and good for children's teeth. That safety verdict should now be re-examined in the light of hundreds of once-secret World War II documents obtained by Griffiths and Bryson, including declassified papers of the Manhattan Project, the United States military group that built the atomic bomb. Joel Griffiths wrote, During the industrial explosion of the 1920s, the U.S. Public Health Service was under the jurisdiction of Treasury Secretary Andrew W. Mellon a founder and major stockholder of the Aluminum Company of America. In 1931, a public health service dentist named H. Trendley Dean was dispatched to remote towns in the West where drinking water wells contained high concentrations of natural fluoride. His mission? To determine how much fluoride people could tolerate without sustaining obvious damage to their teeth. Dean found that teeth in these high fluoride towns were often discolored and eroded, but he also reported that they appeared to have fewer cavities than average. The University of Cincinnati's Kettering Laboratory, funded largely by top fluoride emitters such as Alcoa, quickly dominated fluoride safety research. A book by Kettering scientist and Reynolds Metals consultant E.J. Largent was admittedly written in part, quote, to aid industry in lawsuits arising from fluoride damage, unquote. Nonetheless, the book became a basic international reference work. Frederick B. Exner wrote, Around 1900, the very existence of the smelter industry, both in Germany and Great Britain, was threatened by successful suits for fluoride damage and by burdensome laws and regulations. Today, that same threat hangs over the bulk of American big industry, and fluoridation offers both camouflage and scapegoat, hence the relentless and uncompromising drive for universal fluoridation. Fluoride, the Journal of the International Society for Fluoride Research. Guest Editorial by Andreas Schuld, November 2005. In the physiology of human development, the importance of thyroid hormone is especially evident in the central nervous system in which Th deficiency during the fetal and neonatal periods can lead to morphological and functional abnormalities, the most severe manifestation of which is cretinism. 
Understanding thyroid hormone metabolism is essential in understanding fluoride toxicity. Further research, be it on dental or skeletal fluorosis, effects on IQ, oxidative stress, etc., should focus on this matter with utmost urgency, since it is here that all observed adverse effects can be explained, thereby leading to a new toxicological assessment of fluorosis and, most importantly, proper treatment and prevention. Brain Development on July 18, 2004, England's Sunday Express published an article by Lucy Johnston, health editor. It contained the following. Dr. Peter Mansfield, a GP and director of the Good Healthkeeping Service at Louth, Lincolnshire, studied more than 100 children with behavioral problems. He discovered those with high levels of fluoride in their bodies were more likely to have developmental and behavioral problems. Once the fluoride was taken out of their diet, they got better. He said, this is very worrying. Fluoride is toxic and could cause mental problems. It could be that thousands of children are underperforming as a result. We had children we thought were affected by fluoride. In some cases, they were hyperactive, lacked concentration, and were unhappy all the time. We tested them and quite clearly demonstrated that fluoride was causing their problems. The trouble fluoridated water is causing far outweighs the possible benefits to children's teeth. Nothing like enough work has been done on this and no one is checking. It's very worrying. His findings are borne out by a UNICEF-backed study of 769 school children in China. It found those with mental retardation or low IQ levels had excess fluoride in their systems. The study concluded that the chemical makes mental health problems worse by interfering with the central nervous system. Another study carried out in America found that rats behave like hyperactive children when given a comparable amount of fluoride. The U.S. Economy In his book, Economic Motives Behind Fluoridation, the late Dr. Frederick B. Exner wrote, It is now clear that the one utterly relentless force behind fluoridation is American big industry and that the motive is not profit as such, but fear. In 1942, with the Second World War, there was an enormous increase in fluorine pollution. Steel production expanded, and aluminum, which had been used for pots, pans, and a few airplanes, was needed for an air fleet. Moreover, these industries invaded parts of the country that were not used to fluorine-polluted air. For example, the steel plants in California and Utah, and aluminum factories in Washington and Oregon. Crops and livestock suffer, and people didn't like it. Even the deer in the hills around Provo, Utah, had mottled teeth. Meanwhile, some millions in damage suits were filed, and many hundreds of thousands paid in settlements or judgments. One suit for damage to the members of the Paul Martin family is the only successful suit for damage to humans by fluorine pollution in the United States to date. Alcoa, Kaiser, Harvey Aluminum, Olin Matheson, Victor Chemical, and Food Machinery and Chemical all joined in the suit as friends of the court. Practically all the medical testimony for the company came from four men from Kettering and one formerly from Kettering. The story elsewhere is similar. At Sovi Island, Longview, Tacoma, Spokane, with extensive damage to crops, land, and livestock. At Longview, the people voted down fluoridation in 1952. A few years later, children started to show model teeth, whereupon the council put in fluoridation without a vote. Now the modeling can be blamed on the water rather than the aluminum plant. Chemical and Engineering News, Special Report on Fluoridation, 1988. On August 1, 1988, CNEN published a special report on fluoridation of water. The following excerpts are quoted from that article. In the second clinical stage, pains in the bones become constant and some of the ligaments begin to calcify. Osteoporosis may occur in the long bones, and early symptoms of osteosclerosis are present. Bony spurs may also appear on the limb bones, especially around the knee, the elbow, and on the surface of the tibia and ulna. In advanced skeletal fluorosis, called crippling skeletal fluorosis, the extremities become weak and moving the joints is difficult. The vertebra partially fuse together, crippling the patient. The situation is complicated because the risk of skeletal fluorosis depends on more than the level of fluoride in the water. 
It also depends on nutritional status, intake of vitamin D and protein, absolute amount of calcium, and ratio of calcium to magnesium in drinking water, and other factors. Although skeletal fluorosis has been studied intensely in other countries for more than 40 years, virtually no research has been done in the United States to determine how many people are afflicted with the earlier stages of the disease, particularly the preclinical stages. The Natural Resources Defense Council in the fall of 2004, the Natural Resources Defense Council published a review of Chris Bryson's book, The Fluoride Deception. Here's what it said. Ever wonder about fluoride? Most of us believe the substance is a harmless dental panacea found in toothpaste and fortified water. To industry, fluoride signifies something else entirely. Used to produce and refine aluminum, zinc, uranium, refrigerants, aerosol propellants, insecticides, fertilizers, waterproof coatings, lubricants, firefighting foams, and pharmaceuticals, this adaptable chemical has made fortunes for DuPont, Alcoa, General Motors, and other manufacturing giants. Fluoride has also been key to our nation's ascent to military dominance. Without fluoride, the mighty industry that built airplanes and munitions during two world wars would have been hobbled. Equally significant, without the innovative fluorine-based compounds concocted in corporate and academic research laboratories, the United States might not have been the first to build the atomic bomb. Earth Island Journal, Fluoride and the Phosphate Connection. During the late 1960s, fluoride emissions were damaging crops, killing fish, and causing crippling skeletal fluorosis in livestock. The EPA became concerned and enforced regulations requiring manufacturers to install pollution scrubbers. At that time, the facilities were dumping the concentrated pollution directly into waterways leading into Tampa Bay. In the late 1960s, EPA chemist Irvin Bellick worked out the ideal solution to a monumental pollution problem. Because recovered phosphate fertilizer manufacturing waste contained about 19% fluorine, Bella concluded that the concentrated scrubber liquor could be a perfect water fluoridation agent. It was a liquid and easily soluble in water, unlike sodium fluoride, a waste product from aluminum manufacturing. It was also inexpensive. By 1983, the official EPA policy was expressed by EPA Office of Water Deputy Administrator Rebecca Hanmer as follows. In regard to the use of fluosilicic acid as a source of fluoride for fluoridation, this agency regards such use as an ideal environmental solution to a long-standing problem. By recovering byproduct fluosilicic acid from fertilizer manufacturing, water and air pollution are minimized, and water utilities have a low-cost source of fluoride available to them. EPA regulations. Who comes up with this stuff? On July 9, 2002, Second Look published an article by J. William Hersey, Ph.D., titled Scientific Integrity in a Regulatory Context, an Elusive Ideal at EPA. This is part of what he wrote. There may be a court-ordered schedule of rulemaking facing our office management, and it might involve setting what amounts to a safe exposure level for humans or other species. On occasion, a manager has his or her own idea of what that safe level should be. Or the manager gets orders from up the line, perhaps even the White House or Capitol Hill, that the safe level is some particular value. This is not hypothetical. This has happened and continues to happen. The manager then comes to a staff scientist and says, this is the safe level that we are going to propose in the Federal Register. Write me a justification for it. What is sometimes overtly stated, sometimes not, is, and I don't care what the literature says, my bosses have given me instructions on this, and if you want to stay on my good side, and if you want to see some award money, you will craft for me an elegant justification for this safe level. Fluoride, the Aging Factor by Dr. John Yamianis. In this book, the late John Yamianis, Ph.D., explains the nuts and bolts involved with fluoride poisoning. 
through the eyes of a biochemist. He also writes about the special interests and people behind the promotion of water fluoridation, who they are, how they operate, and why they scratch each other's back. John and I worked together on a major court case in Pittsburgh in 1978, and for several months my daughter Julie and I lived with the Yamianis family at the farm in Delaware, Ohio. Julie, by the way, was poisoned by fluoride as an infant and experienced a spontaneous fracture of her ankle as a child. The x-rays were identical to those published in case reports of skeletal fluorosis. Later, as a teenager, she lost her thyroid gland to cancer, also because of fluoride. I myself lived with arthritis, allergies, and gastrointestinal problems from age 7, almost died in anaphylactic shock at age 18, and had symptoms suggesting a series of small strokes by age 25. After an EEG showed clear evidence of poisoning by some unknown chemical, I changed my diet. Within a year, all of my health problems had disappeared. The twisted joints in my hands were permanent reminders, but my arthritis was gone and it stayed gone as long as I avoided fluoride as much as possible. Then, at age 54, I discovered the joys of fibromyalgia caused by fluoride air pollution. For three months, the pain was excruciating and relentless. Justice Flaherty was thoroughly convinced that water fluoridation was increasing the cancer death rates, but when he issued an injunction to stop it in Pennsylvania, he discovered the courts don't have jurisdiction because water fluoridation is considered a legitimate police power of the state. At about the same time, Michigan became the first state to repeal its mandatory water fluoridation law, giving citizens the right to vote rather than forcing it on them. This came about after I persuaded Governor Milliken's staff there was evidence that although the concentration of fluoride in the water supply hadn't changed, the concentration in food had increased dramatically. Two committees were appointed to look into the matter, and then Michigan's Toxic Substance Control Commission got involved and issued a warning. At one point, the director of the Michigan Department of Public Health gave radio and newspaper interviews supporting my point of view about runaway dosage, way back then. Then he quit his job and took another at the department. The story made headlines in several newspapers, and my husband stopped telling me I couldn't fight City Hall. I was lucky. The legislature was revising the health code. All they had to do was leave out the part about mandatory water fluoridation. The Michigan Dental Association, the American Dental Association, and numerous other individuals and groups did their best, but it wasn't enough. The people would decide. In August 1983, the big guns got together for a symposium at the University of Michigan. According to Dr. Yamianis, the stated purpose of the meeting was to discuss the status of organized opposition to fluoridation, to analyze probable motives influencing the anti-fluoridation movement, to assess the need for a national fluoridation strategy, to develop political and legal strategies for the defense and promotion of fluoridation, and to evaluate past legal and political pro-fluoridation initiatives, focusing on the defeats as well as the victories. John also writes about Stephen Barrett of QuackWatch.com, who sued me for 100,000 U.S. dollars a few years ago and lost. I had challenged him to name just one fluoridation safety study capable of finding what it was supposed to be looking for, and then published the fact that he couldn't name one, although he claims there were hundreds. Conclusion The controversy over fluoride isn't about science. It's about politics. It's all about controlling how we as consumers perceive the world around us. Is that beautiful bright red apple really good for your child or yourself? Or does it have something hidden inside that's not good at all? I think you have a right to know. But I'm not in the apple business. I also think it's time for the U.S. government to admit they made a mistake with fluoride. But I'm not in charge of national security or the economy either. Well, that's the end of my message. Now you know why there's fluoride in your toothpaste, what fluoride can do if you get too much of it, where it's coming from, and especially why it's very important to be careful with fluoride toothpaste or mouthwash, and as much as possible, avoid foods grown with artificial fertilizers and pesticides. If you need a prescription drug, ask for one that doesn't contain fluoride in its chemical structure. 
and be wary of mineral supplements that don't show the fluoride content on the label. If you live in an artificially fluoridated area, each liter of water will provide about one milligram of fluoride, one part per million. If you have your own well, it could be as little as 0.2 milligrams, or very rarely, as much as eight milligrams per liter. But ordinary well water tests don't involve fluoride. EPA's Drinking Water Division set an enforceable maximum concentration of four parts per million for municipal drinking water supplies. But their pesticide division allows as much as 130 parts per million, almost 60 milligrams per pound from sulfuryl fluoride pesticide residues in or on our food. It isn't possible to avoid fluorides altogether. And I'm not suggesting that everything you buy at the grocery store is unfit to eat. But, quite frankly, a lot of it is worth less than the container it comes in. One more thing. Thanks for listening. Until we can't even think straight anymore